Well, good morning to everybody. Fall has finally arrived, and we're thankful to God for that. Ken did a good job in leading us in some songs, talking about the glory of God and giving Him thanks for everything that we have. And especially if you're a guest here today, we're very thankful to have you. We know that there are a lot of churches in this area, and you could have gone wherever, but you came here. And we're just so glad to have you. And if you are looking for a church home, we do pray that you would consider this church. I've been here a pretty long time, and this is a good church, as good of a church as I've been a part of, my wife and I. So we're glad to have you here today. Uh, You may have noticed on the front of your bulletin, we are entering into an elder selection process. And I have learned one thing over the years. If people can misunderstand, they will. So let me make this really clear. We are not getting rid of the five current elders or shepherds that we have. We are adding some additional ones. And to make it even more clear, exactly how many are you going to add? The answer to that is we don't know. More than likely, what we have talked about is two to three. That depends on who the Holy Spirit brings to the surface through the process that uh, we'll be describing. You have a timeline on the front of your bulletin. It describes the timetable in which we're going to be selecting these additional shepherds, elders, pastors. All those mean the same thing as I'll show plainly here in just a second. You see the process. I'm going to be preaching on uh, what we are to be looking for, what kind of men. I'm going to do that today, next Sunday, and the 27th. And then it will be up to this church to look out from among ourselves and to, based upon what we have been taught from Scripture, then it is our job to go to work. Uh, I put this little timeline thing up here because what you see in the New Testament, I don't want to go into all the verses right now because we don't have time, but the early church, the church, which is the new people of God, you know, God has always had a people through which he has worked. In the Old Testament, it was the Jewish people, the Jewish nation through which he brought about the Messiah. But now God has a new people in the new covenant, which is what we are under. That's why we have a new testament. God has a new people, and it's not people of one particular ethnicity. It is people from all races, from all backgrounds, and these are people who are God's church. The church began after Jesus was crucified on the cross, and then he was resurrected. That happened in approximately the year A.D. 29 or 30. And then just 50 days after that, on the day of Pentecost, which was a Jewish feast day, on that day, this was recorded in our Bible in the book of Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up and he was teaching all the people who were there from all over the known world, and his sermon was about Jesus. And many people, after they had heard that they had crucified Jesus, who was God's Messiah, God had sent to save them, they were convicted and they were cut to their heart, And many people then responded and became Christians. And according to New Testament, I know our world teaches different, but according to the New Testament, there is no such thing as saying a prayer or inviting Jesus to come into your heart, and that is how you are saved. I know that's common teaching today, but it's nowhere in the New Testament. What you see in the New Testament is these people were convicted in their heart And they knew they weren't in a right relationship with the Lord and they confessed their sins. And they said, what do we need to do? They asked an inspired apostle. And here is what an inspired apostle said. He didn't say, you need to invite Jesus into your heart or say a prayer. That is not what he said. And I hope you'll all go check me out on this. It's in Acts chapter 2. When they said, what do we need to do? We've offended God. We're not right with God. How do we need to get back in the right relationship with God? In verse 38, here is what an inspired apostle Peter said. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. What is baptism for? It is for the forgiveness of your sins. And when you do that, you will receive a gift. And what is the gift? It is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then if you read on down from verse 39 through verse 47, which is the last verse in that chapter, you see what this early church was like. One of the things they were like, they were a giving church like we've shown today, to help out a family in our church that's in need. And verse 47 of Acts 2 says, And the Lord added daily to his number those who were being saved. Or some versions say he added to the church those who were being saved. That's when the New Testament church came into existence. 
And when you read the rest of your New Testament, the way that early church did things was very simple. You know, we have simple worship in here. It's not complicated. Uh, we, have, we do everything kind of simply. The organization and the structure of the church that you see in the New Testament is actually very simple. But what you see on this timeline here, from where the church started and where it is now over here, there have been lots of departures from the simple plan that you see in the New Testament. And lots of things that are paraded around today as being church is really not what you see anywhere in the New Testament. And so what we are trying to do here, we don't do it perfectly. I'm not going to lie and say, if you're a guest here, we do everything perfect. We have it figured out exactly right. No, we're people. But we really believe that our authority and our guide is the New Testament. It's what God's Word says, His new covenant with us. And so we look at that very, very hard and we pray over it and we try to discern what God's will is from what that says. And that's the kind of church that we want to be. And so when we're looking for additional leaders in our church, additional shepherds, additional elders, pastors, all those words are used interchangeably that I'll show you here in a second. You need to know what kind of men it is that you need to be looking for. And so that's what we're going to look at as we study the New Testament. So this passage in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul said, Now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. And the gifts he gave were people. He gave apostles. He gave prophets. He gave evangelists. He gave pastors and teachers. And their job is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, which is the body of Christ. Now, we no longer have apostles and prophets. Those were specific men for a specific time, and they have since died a long time ago, centuries and centuries ago. But we do have their words. Their words are recorded for us. Prophets in the Old and New Testament and the words of the apostles are recorded for us in the, in the New Testament. And we still have evangelists. That's what I am. An evangelist is one who proclaims the Word of God, who proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ or the Gospel. I want you to notice something about this. And I know this is not the, what you see in our world today. But did you notice that an evangelist and a pastor are not the same thing? So many people, and I'm not saying you're going to hell over it, don't get me wrong, okay? But we need to use the phrases and words and terms in the Bible the way God intended for them to be used. Brothers and sisters, I am not the pastor of this church. We actually have five pastors of this church. They are our elders. You see right here, I think everybody can see plainly that an evangelist and a pastor and teacher are not the same. Does everybody see that? This is what God has said. This is not my idea. This is not the idea of the Church of Christ. This is what you see plainly in Scripture. And then I love this passage in the book of Titus, which is in a little book towards the end of the New Testament known as a pastoral epistle or letter, better way to put it. He writes these three little letters, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, to these pastors of churches, or what it means to pastor or lead a church. And he says, I left you, he's talking to a preacher, Timothy, here's why I left you in Crete. I left you there in order to, to set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city. Actually, he's talking to Titus, a young preacher here. Here's why I left you in Crete. Things aren't what they should be there. Things are out of order. Things are not organized in the way that pleases God. So what I want you to do, Titus, I want you to set in order what remains there, and I want you to appoint some elders in every city where there's a church. That is God's plan. Nowhere do you see, and I hope you'll go get your New Testament out and read and study it, which is really what I encourage you to do. There is nowhere, anywhere in the New Testament where you see that the leader of a church is one man. Brothers and sisters, I know that's what we're used to today. I know that's what is paraded before us in many kinds of churches. That's what is right. But that is not what you see anywhere in the New Testament. Notice this word right here, elders, is plural. It's always plural in the New Testament. That's why we don't have one elder here. We have five right now and we're going to be adding to that. We have elders. Why do we do that? Because that's what we see 
in the New Testament. And then I love this verse in Philippians. He says, this letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the overseers and deacons. As I'll plainly show you here in a minute in one passage, this word overseer is used interchangeably with the word elder or shepherd or pastor. It describes a function of an elder. An elder's job, one of their jobs is, is to oversee the flock. They are to be on the lookout for what's going on in the flock. They are to be on the lookout for what's going on in the hearts and lives of people. And if something is astray in people's hearts and lives, they are to go to their aid and to their rescue. They are to oversee the overall direction and function of a church. That is what an elder or a pastor or an overseer is to do. And notice that they are different from the deacons. Now we'll talk about deacons at some point in the future, probably next year. But deacons are different than overseers. We have 14 deacons at this church. A deacon is a special servant. They are called to do a special task, tasks that need to be done in a church, which if the elders and the preachers did those things, the elders and the preachers wouldn't be able to do their role and their task. And so these special servants carry out those tasks. And we have 14 of them who are officially called deacons who do a good job of that, and we have a lot of other people who are really kind of doing the job of a deacon. They just don't have the role or the title yet. In Acts chapter 15, the first or the second major problem in the church, the biggest problem that you see in this New Testament church is there were some people who came out of the original church in Jerusalem, and here's what they were saying. They were teaching false doctrine. False doctrine is not a new thing. It started with the original church. And here's what they were saying. It's not enough to put your faith and trust in Jesus and repent and be baptized. Yeah, you need to do that, but you also need to do something else. In order to pe people to be saved, they need to act like Jews. The men need to be circumcised. They need to keep, keep the dietary food laws. Get rid of the pork rinds and bacon at your potlucks. We can't have any of that anymore. You need to keep all the Jewish festivals and, and fellowships. And so the apostles, it says, they get together and they talk about this. The apostles and elders. And I want you to notice the church was involved too. The church is hearing this false teaching and they sent Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem accompanied by some local believers and who did they talk to? They talked to the apostles who were, the apostles were preachers, is primarily what they were. They talked to the apostles and the elders about this question. So that kind of gives you an idea of what they did. And then it goes on and says, so the apostles and elders, they met together to resolve this issue. Sometimes there are serious things going on in a church and leaders of a church, which is why you have leaders, they need to meet together and discern what the will of God is. And so that's what they do. They try to figure this out. And then it says, Then the apostles and elders, together with the whole church in Jerusalem, they sent delegates, and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. They decided what needed to be done. No, you don't have to become a Jew to be saved. Men don't have to be circumcised to be saved. All that is necessary is to put your faith and trust in Jesus, repent and be baptized. They did give some guidelines for certain social things not to do because it is so offensive and so ungodly. But the point that I want to make here is kind of how you see New Testament elders functioning. They met together with the apostles who were preachers and the church was involved in this as well, and they met together to decide on issues that were troubling and bothering the church. That's one thing that elders still do today. That's an oversight function. If there's ungodliness going on, or if there's false teaching going on, the elders will get together and they will meet and they'll talk about these things. And they'll come up with decisions. That's not all that elders do, but that is one of the things that they do is to decide how things need to go if they are not going the way that the will of God is. But this next passage is going to plainly show us, and if this is a passage you've never seen before, you need to underline this one in your Bible. In one verse, he shows us plainly how these words, terms in the New Testament are used interchangeably. Also in Acts chapter 20, it says, talking about Paul, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and he called for the elders. And I put in brackets there a Greek word because this Greek word presbyteros, maybe you've heard of Presbyterian, that's where they get that name from. Here's what that name means. An elder or a presbyteros means an older man. 
who has experience and wisdom. Now, we all know, Chris said this last week when he was here, and he's right. Some people just get old. They don't get experience or wisdom. You're not just looking for old people. You're looking for people who are older, and with that age, they have gained experience, and they've gained a lot of wisdom. So from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, and he called for the elders. He called for the elders of the church to come to him, and he said, pay careful attention to yourselves and also to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Does everybody see that the term overseer, which is episkopos, that's two Greek words stuck together. The word epi means over in Greek, and skopos, you can imagine what that means, scope things out, to look, to oversee. Look for these overseers who will shepherd, the Greek word poimain, or here it's used as a verb, their job is to do what a shepherd does. It literally is a Latin term, and, and it literally means a shepherd out in the field who would lead sheep to pasture to where they could be fed. So you see that these terms are all used interchangeably. If you can see that in this passage, I want to stop here just for a second. If you can see that, raise your hand. Okay. Some of you are still afraid to raise your hand. You, you can participate in church. But you see these terms that are used interchangeably. And then he says one of the things about an elder, or one of the things about an overseer, or one of the things about a shepherd, all the same role. One of the things about him, he says, they are to pay careful attention to themselves and to all the flock. The kind of men that we're looking for, that we're going to ask you all to look for. You're going to be looking for people who pay close attention to their life. Have you all ever noticed that we pay... We pay close attention to a lot of stuff, but sometimes we don't pay close attention to the direction that our life is going. Y'all ever notice how we do that sometimes? He says, no, you're looking for men who pay close attention to their life. And he says, the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. What he's talking about is the process of praying and fasting and the church and uh, preachers, apostles, and everybody being involved in this, the Holy Spirit is at work in that process. And through that process, he appoints. He is at work. He appoints these shepherds, these elders, these overseers to this task. And then these next verses in Acts 20 are very telling also about exactly how they're to do this. He says, I know that after my departure, Paul says, when I leave, I know what's going to happen. Fierce wolves are going to come in among you. They won't spare the flock. And from among your own selves there will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. And so now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So here he tells us specifically what's going to happen. I know when I leave, here's what's going to take place. People are going to come in from outside this church. They're going to infiltrate your church. And they're going to say things that aren't right. And they'll stir a bunch of people up. And it'll cause your church to go into a tizzy. But that's not the only place false teaching is going to come from. It also comes from within. In fact, he says it could be some of your own elders. Could be some people who are already leaders in your church or other members of your church from within. And he says, so what you are to do is, the way that you take care of those things is, guys, the kind of men we're looking for is people who know the Word of God. We're going to be looking for men who know the Bible. They know what it says. They know what is true. They know what is false because they have spent time in God's Word and they are very familiar with it. And that's how, how they are able to instruct and give guidance. Now, this passage in Titus we looked at before, the one on the left, Titus 1.5. He says, here's why I left you in Crete, Titus. I left you there to appoint elders. Now he tells us what they're supposed to do. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy word, the Bible, as taught, so that he'll be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and able to rebuke those who contradict it. How can you guide a flock of God's people unless you know what God wants them to do? How can you combat false teaching unless you know what true teaching looks like? So what you're looking for, he says, and what we're going to challenge this church to do in just a couple of weeks. In fact, on the 27th, we're going to ask you, we want you to nominate some people. You need to be looking for people who know God's Word. 
And they can use God's Word. And they can apply it to any situation that comes up, to people who are hurting in their congregation. They can apply it to false teaching. They can use it to encourage and to build people up. These are the kind of people that we are to be looking for. He gives some further things in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Let the elders who rule, and I put the Greek word in parentheses there, proestotes, and I'll show you why I put that there in just a second. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. He's talking about paying them. We don't pay our elders here, but it will, would it be wrong to do it? Absolutely not. There were elders who were paid in New Testament times. That's what this word honor means. Especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Once again, you get the idea that one of the main functions of elders is they know God's word well. And they know how to teach it. That doesn't mean that they have to be able to stand up here like this and to be able to explain God's word the way that I or other preachers are doing it. But they know what the word of God says. But I want to show you another passage right after this because of our culture today, when someone hears the word rule, we can get the wrong idea. What does this word rule mean? One of the ways I like to interpret the Bible is look at other passages that use the same word. And how is it used there? Look in 1 Timothy 3. He must manage proestamenon. It's the exact same, same Greek root word. just has a different ending. He is to manage or rule his own household well. What he's saying is the kind of people you're looking for is men who know how to manage and lead their own household well. That's what it means to rule. Now, typically, when we hear the word rule, we kind of think of a king who is sitting on a throne all high and mighty and he's passing down mandates to his subjects and kind of has an air of authority and arrogance about him. And I've seen some elders like that. Not here, but I have in some other churches, and you probably have too. That's not what this word means. I don't know about you, but in my house, when our daughter was still there, and still now with my wife, I don't sit on a high throne and pass down mandates. That wouldn't work in my house. And I, I, I think I hear from some of that laughter. That's probably not going to fly real well in your house either. It talks about you interacting with your family in such a way that you give good guidance and you give good leadership, but you don't just pass down mandates. You don't have an attitude and an air of authority about you. That doesn't work well. Let me give you a perfect example. I've been a, a preacher in churches in lots of different places over the years. And I've seen good elders and I've seen bad ones. I've seen good preachers and bad ones. I've seen good deacons and bad ones. Good church members and bad ones. That's the case everywhere. But let me tell you the worst example of an elder I ever saw. I won't tell you the, the place exactly, but uh, Laura and I, actually, we were on an interview, interviewing for to be the, the new ministry family at this church. And uh, the elders, there were three of them, if I recall, they had us, uh, this is a, in another state, another place, years and years ago. They had us in a room, and they were talking to us and interviewing, and um, there was one elder in there. The other two were fine. They were very polite and very respectful and very kind to ask good questions, but there was one that was just a flat-out jerk. He kept asking these questions that were very inappropriate. He would make comments of uh, degradation towards me and sometimes towards my wife. Just, just the way he was. He was just a jerk. And it was obvious that he was used to being the ruling elder in the way that he interpreted that word wrongly. He was the one who was being in charge. All the other elders cowered to him. You could tell that they were somewhat uncomfortable with the way the interview was going. And at one point, he said something like this. After a whole bunch of other things that he said that were very inappropriate, very pointed, just, just out, of, out of place. He said, well, I want to ask you something. He was talking to me. He said, uh... I want to know why you can't stay in one place more than three or four years. Just said it like that with an, just an arrogant kind of way of saying it. And my wife had about had enough. If you know my wife, my wife is about as mild and passive and calm of a person as you're going to see. But you also need to know something about my wife. She does have a line. And if you go past that line, she is not a doormat. Let me put it that way. And my wife in this interview, he asked this, just this air of arrogance, expecting us to cower before him just so we could get that job. My wife looked at him and says, because we keep running into people like you. <laughs> 
And I said, couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> I knew right then, even if they would have offered us the job, there's zero chance we're coming to this church. I am not. We told them so there that night. There, even if you did offer us the job, I'm sure you would now, but even if you did, there is zero chance we would come. And I pointed to, pointed to the other two elders. I said, you guys do seem to fit what I see in Scripture. You're humble. This guy's not. This guy's a bully. And that's not what you're looking for in an elder. I love this passage in James because in James, he gives us the idea of what an elder is supposed to look like. What, is, what does an elder do? He, earlier, right before this passage right here, he says, if anybody is sick, what are you supposed to do, church flock? You call the elders of the church and let them come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. That describes one of the main jobs of an elder. They care about people. You're looking for people that you, you know they care about people so much because that's the way they are. They're not in this high and mighty seat to where they want to pass down mandates upon other people and bully people. That's not an elder. An elder is somebody who cares about people. It's somebody that when you're sick and you're hurting, not only physically but in other kind of ways, that's somebody that you say, hey, I want to call them and I want them to come and pray for me. That's who you're looking for. I remember when I was first baptized into Christ, when I first became a Christian, I was a senior in high school, way back in the dark ages before the internet, way back there. I, it was so fortunate that the church that I was placed in, the Parkview Church of Christ in Odessa, this is where I was baptized, a church of about 200 people and just a great, great church. They had three elders there and these were just great men. And instead of bullying that church, what I always saw them do was helping people out, encouraging people, being a blessing to people. And at the time, I wanted to become a, a preacher almost, almost as soon as I came out of the baptistry. I think God put that in me. And quite honestly, I don't know what you think now, but at the time, I wasn't very good. <laughs> we had this program called the First Wednesday Night. The first Wednesday night of every month, uh, they organized it to where the young men led the whole service. Some would do the singing. For some reason, they never asked me to do that. Don't know why. Uh, some would do the singing. Some would do the announcements and the prayers and so forth. And, you know, I was one of the ones that they would pick to do the sermon from time to time, along with some other young men. And I wasn't good. I still have... We, uh, young people, we used to have these things called cassette tapes. I'm not making this up. It wasn't all digitalized, and you put it in this device, and a tape actually ran. And I still have some of those tapes from these sermons. Oh, they're bad. I mean, they're really bad. But I do remember that after each one of those times when I would speak, these elders and other members from the congregation would come up and say, Good job, Mike. Good job, Mike. One of these days, I remember one of them saying, One of these days you're going to make a great preacher. And I remember the preacher of our church standing there, and I remember him not saying anything. I'm not sure. I don't think he was sure. But these elders, they were just so encouraging. Such godly men. That's the kind of people that you're looking for. You're looking for people who you feel like I can just call them to my side and they really care about me and they care about what is going on in my life. So to kind of sum things up, what kind of men are we going to ask you to be looking for here in a couple of weeks when we put our whole church to work, which is what you see in Scripture? You're going to be looking for older men, presbyteros, plural. These are older men who have experience and wisdom. And some of you might be wondering, well, how old do they have to be? Do they have to be as old as Joe Priest? <laughs> you don't have to be 112, no. No, Joe's not 112. He's not even 90 yet, but he is getting close. But, and I don't know exactly, but I do know this. I know how Greek words are used in the New Testament. And I do know that the word for a young man is used up to someone who is at least 40 years of age. In other words, 40 and under was considered young. So kind of putting that together with this, I think you're looking for somebody who's at least over 40. I knew a congregation one time that appointed a man who was an elder who was 32 years old. Nothing against you 32-year-olds, but you know what? I just look back on my life. I know a lot more now and have a lot more wisdom than I did when I was 32. You're looking for somebody who is older. Doesn't mean you have to be 60 or 70, but I would think at least 40 
something. That's just kind of a general guideline, not a, not a you know, book, chapter, and verse. But you're looking for somebody who is older who's gained a lot of wisdom and experience with age. And then you're looking for overseers. These are men who look out for and oversee others under their care. They really care about people. They're all constantly on the lookout for people in their flock. In fact, you'd be looking for people who are doing it right now. Just giving them the title is not going to make them all of a sudden start doing it. Look for people who are doing these things right now. And you're looking for a shepherd. A shepherd is somebody who cares for the sick, who cares for the hurting, hurting in lots of different ways. They go after those who have gone astray and they're feeding the flock. Once again, you're looking for people. You're not hoping if we give them the title, they'll start doing that. No, brothers and sisters. You're looking for people who are doing that right now. Just giving them a title is not going to make that part of their character. You look for people who have this character right now. That's who we're going to ask you to be looking for. And I love this passage in Acts chapter 13. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly the process that we are to go through to appoint elders. In fact, the only thing it says is the preachers appointed them. But that's because they didn't even have any existing elders. But it does give us some indications from some other places, and this is one of those. It says, there were these prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch. It says there was Barnabas and there was Simeon. It was called Niger. There was Lucius the Cyrenian. There was Manaean, who was a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch from childhood. And then it says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, I want you to separate unto me Barnabas and Saul... For the work to which I have called them, the mission work that they were to go on. And so after they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and then they sent them off. And I think what Paul is trying to say right here, he's saying, you know what? The way in which I was appointed as an apostle or as a missionary here along with Barnabas is a good way, a good pattern for how the church is to appoint leaders through prayer and fasting. And so here's what we're asking you to do, and this is the point of this message. We're going to ask you to be praying and fasting for the Holy Spirit to make known the men that He desires to serve as elders, overseers, shepherds. That's all the same role here at Landmark. That's what we're going to be asking you to do. And you see on the front of your bulletin there, that process that's in there, I'm going to preach on this next Sunday. I'm going to talk about some different kind of things. And then on the 27th, I'll talk about some different things. And then beginning on the 27th of this month, that's when it's your job. We're going to ask you to look out from among yourselves, which is taken from a passage in Acts chapter 6, and involve the church, which we've already seen in some of these passages today. And we're asking you to look for these kind of men and the kind of men who have the kind of character that I'll talk about next week that's described in the book of First Timothy and the book of Titus. That's what we're, we're calling you to action. But I want everybody to know one thing before we leave here today. Some of you might think, well, what does this sermon have to do with me? I'm not an elder. I'm only 32 years old. Or I'm a woman. It's hard for a woman to be the husband of one wife, which is what the text says about an elder. Some churches do it. I don't know how they get that out of Scripture, but somehow they do. But uh, So what does this have to do with me? Here's the interesting thing about everything that we've looked at today. All these kind of functions and qualities that you're to be looking for in a church leader, an elder, an overseer, a shepherd, is something that all of us are to have. When you read through the New Testament, what does God want all of us to to do. He wants all of us, as we grow older, not just to grow older, He also wants us to grow in wisdom and experience and learn and be more spiritually mature. And so we all need to ask ourselves this morning, is that true of me? Have I only just gotten older? Or have I also grown to be more spiritually mature? And if not, what do I need to do about that? God also asks all of us, I want you to be people who are on the lookout for your brothers and sisters in Christ. God wants all of us to be looking out in this congregation and paying attention to what's going on with the flock here. And if you see people who are hurting physically, emotionally, relationally, whatever kind of way, financially, whatever the way is, 
Are you the kind of person that says, you know, I'm going to try to do something about that. I'm going to try to intervene in these people's lives. This is what God is looking for in us. He also wants us all to be shepherds, to pay attention to what is going on to one another, to help feed other people. That's why it's so important to come every Sunday and every Wednesday and Sunday night whenever we meet. Because it's hard to know what's going on with the other sheep here if you never see the sheep. If you don't know how the sheep normally act, how are you going to know when they're not acting normal? One of the things I like to do, maybe you all notice sometimes, sometimes I just kind of stand around and watch people. You know what I'm doing? I'm trying to pay attention. I'm not always good at discerning, you know, when something is going on, but sometimes I'm pretty good. Sometimes if you just listen and watch and put your cell phone up for a minute and watch what's going on with people, sometimes God will say, you know, I think you maybe you need to go talk to them. I think maybe you need to bring the elders in. Let's, let's see if we I think maybe something's going on and maybe we need to help them. That's why we took up a special contribution for a family today. Some of us figured out, you know, I think they might need some help. Family didn't come to us. Some people were just looking out and saying, you know, I think they might need some, I think they might need some help. And it's good for everybody to help. So we're going to ask you in a couple of weeks to be a part of this process. And so today I want to lead us in a prayer to hopefully get us all in the habit of between now and that time before we select additional shepherds for all of us to be praying and fasting for God to make known the people that he wants to serve as shepherds here at Landmark. So let's pray.